what does an ex-UFC turned bouncer have to do with a nun who gets immaculately conceived in a convent have in common? Not much besides both these films, Roadhouse and Immaculate, just came out. One on Amazon Prime with Roadhouse, and the other is a horror film from Neon, starring Sydney Sweeney in theaters with Immaculate. Let's get into these films. Immaculate Conceived, I like Immaculately that. Immaculately Conceived. What's up, movie friends? Welcome back to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. We're going to do a special episode today reviewing two new releases. We're going to get into Roadhouse first. And we're going to split it up. So yeah. the first half will be Roadhouse. Don't do yes. our intermission. Second half will be... Immaculate. Immaculate. I don't, know, I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I did it with such a demon voice because it is kind of demon y. Yeah, there's demon it's stuff. It's kind of to demon y, yeah, I guess you could say. It's sort of satanic. It's interesting. But let's get into Roadhouse from director Doug Lyman, written by Anthony Bagarozzi, Chuck Mondry, and R. Lance Hall. Doug Lyman, well known for making films like The Born Identity, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Edge of Tomorrow, and American Made, as well as a bunch of others. The thing with Roadhouse is I can't tell if it was if I loved it or if I just liked it. Or if it was just like, meh. Overall, it, let's talk about the film. Yeah. So, ex-UFC fighter Dalton, played by the wonderful, the great, the shredded Jake Gyllenhaal, <laughs> takes a job as a bouncer at a Florida Keys roadhouse. Florida Keys is in Florida, just the islands off the coast of that state, in case you're not familiar with that oh, region of the world. Thank you. Uh, only to discover that his paradise, this paradise he has new, soon discovered, is not all it seems. It's obviously a remake of the original from 1989, starring Patrick Swayze, which is really interesting because... Did you do a line of coke today? No, I'm just bit, I'm amped up. <laughs> I'm ready to go, man. <laughs> oh, my God. Bring in the energy, bro. <laughs> Bring in the energy. Just let me do my thing. Let me do my thing. Maybe I did a lot of coke. I've never seen this Maybe energy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways... So, where was I? You interrupted me. I was on I was flowing so well. Not as all that it seems. What I say? I don't know. Well, oh yeah, Patrick Swayze. What's interesting is obviously Jake and Patrick both starred in Donnie Darko yes. back in the day. So, it's actually interesting that he's redoing a role that Patrick Swayze did who passed away like about 10 years ago now. IMDb Roadhouse is a 6.2 with about 50,000 ratings right now. Rotten Tomatoes, it is a 61% critic score. 56% audience score. Its letterbox score is pretty bad at a 2.7. Yikes. I think it's a little too low. People on letterbox are either too harsh or too forgiving with movies. Stars Jake Gyllenhaal as Dalton, Daniela Melchor as Ellie, Conor McGregor kid as Knox, <laughs> Billy Magnuson as Ben Brandt, Jessica Williams as Frankie, as well as a role from Post Malone as Austin. As Austin. Yes, Austin's his name. I didn't even know he had a name. I tried to find him in the He has a poster. It says Austin something last name. I think Post Malone fans will be disappointed how little he's in the film. Yeah, I thought he was going to be a lot in, in it a lot because he got his own branding. And he's really in it for like 30 seconds. No, he's in it for like two minutes. <laughs> All right, he's in it for two, two minutes two and minutes. ten seconds. Yeah, two All minutes right. and ten yeah, seconds. Yeah, give, yeah. Him, give the man his All due, right. Anthony. What was your letterbox rating of Roadhouse? Did I do a rating? Let me check. I rated. I, I, I actually I rated it. Go th first. I rated it three and a half stars out of five. Just because, you know, it was just one of those movies where it's just, don't take it seriously. It's an odd film. It's a weird movie. But it can be fun. And it has some good fights. And it has, yeah. You know, when it got rolling, it got pretty good by the third act. Those are interesting adjectives to use for this film. Weird yes. and odd. But I think that connects to the tone of the movie. I rated it three stars. I had a good time with this movie. We did a Discord watch party. So if you want to watch movies with us in the Discord, all you got to do is become a patron on patreon.com slash Raiders of Lost Podcast. We do watch parties about twice a month, and we did Roadhouse. Well, first, we, we tried to watch um, Ricky Stanicki, and we were all just like, this is not we it. We were not Let's feeling this it. change to another Amazon Prime original with Roadhouse. <laughs> this movie was supposed to get a theatrical release. Doug Lyman was basically told i think the story was if the movie's good enough then amazon will release it in theaters mm -hmm. and they did not and he was boycotting the film and was not going to support the film or go to the premieres but he ended up going to the premiere which is like a week and a half ago and supporting the film i understand how frustrated it must have been to be a filmmaker being expecting to have a theatrical release yeah it is what it is i think if it was released in theaters it would have done okay I don't see it being a box office hit, but still, money's money. But I don't think Amazon really needs too much money to, at the end of the day. That's the last thing they need. And for me, I had a good time with this movie. It really tries to take advantage of the nostalgia with the original because the original is sort of this Western vibe. It's in Missouri, I think. And even though this one's in the Florida Keys, it's trying to capture that Western feel with dialogue, which I don't think really worked very well. They're like, hey, partner and stuff like that. Like, you're, what are you doing? Like, the typical lingo and jargon you hear in a Western was in was in this movie. And they basically alluded to Jake's character, Dalton, being like the man with no name yeah. character. Yeah, yeah. 
coming in and into a town, saving the people from villains, and then leaving. And then he has that constant back and forth with the little girl at the bookstore talking about Western characters. And him leave. And it's just that whole movie. I was just like, oh, they're doing like a Western outlaw lead as like Jake's character. And that's like, I think the approach they took to it. Yeah. And this movie, I think, had a lot of really great elements. The fight scenes were actually really good. I've seen a lot of mixed reviews about the combat and the mm-hmm. fighting because a lot of it was done with green screen. Well, not green screens, but well, yeah, there were. I think over reliance on blue screens in this movie. Yes. As well as a lot of CGI. But the fight sequences, either people are loving or they're really not enjoying it because CGI was involved with the fight sequences. However, they did this really cool thing called an ABCD pass. Now, the stunt coordinator on this film was Garrett Warren, who's been who's done a ton of huge movies. He's one of the biggest stunt coordinators out there. He's like done Logan, Avatar, massive, massive films. He's a, he's always a stunt coordinator mm-hmm. on. He also does stunts himself, but they, this, the fight sequences in this movie, I never really seen anything quite like it before. It was very unique because they try to make it as realistic to what it looks like to get punched in the face or to actually take a blow versus stacking punches, putting distance in between actors and, and stunt performers so that when you're throwing a punch, you're several inches away from the person's actual face. So you're not actually hitting them. You're stacking it with camera angles and distance to kind of cheat it to make it look like it. But they did this this new uh, type of filmmaking called ABCD Pass that they kind of figured out where they're blending four shots together of all the fight scenes and then making that one sequence. So the first pass, you could say, or the first shot that they would get was the person, the actor, the character throwing a punch. The second shot they would get of the exact same movement is the person would have a red pad in their hand and they'd be hitting as hard as they can. The third pass, the third shot that they would do would be their hand hitting a pad for real. So someone would be holding a stunt pad, a pad right where that other performer would be, hitting that as hard as they can for real. And then the fourth pass they did for the filmmaking was a blank background pass with nothing in the foreground. And then they blended many of these shots together to sort of simulate actually getting hit, actually what it looks like to get punched in the face, to get punched in the stomach versus stacking punches and not making contact. So... The fights, for the most part, looked really cool. But like we said earlier, there's a lot of CGI. I think that they're onto something here. And this is just the first step in this direction of a new kind of technique for capturing action in fights. Because you can see there's a lot of potential there. It didn't look perfect uh, a good amount of the time. But it was very interesting. And on top of that, what it does is it eliminates the stage, the staging part of fight sequences you see in films, and it looks like realistic punches. Like, in a movie, I, something that drives me nuts sometimes is, like, someone will throw a punch, and it's just like it knocks the person back. And especially when it's someone smaller than the person getting hit, and you're like, there's no way that punch would, like, throw this guy to the ground. Off the, and then capture... Unless it's a superhero movie. Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Unless it's that, that's the force being put onto the character. If you watch UFC, if you watch boxing... And these guys are fighters in the story, so it makes sense. When they're getting punched, they're not getting thrown back. They're just they're taking the hits. They're they're getting punched in the face, but they're not like being thrown to the floor. And so it, they were able to eliminate that that over theatrical movement and action that you see in fight scenes a lot of the time. And then even though the CGI didn't quite work, it was for me, I was watching and I was like, you know what, this is pretty close to what these guys would actually do to each other, where, you know, Jake's hitting Conor McGregor. McGregor's not falling back into the floor. He's still driving towards him. He's taking the blows because how many times does a UFC fighter get hit in the face in one match? It's a ton. A lot, unless they get knocked out. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're, the characters were able to take punches. You know what I mean? No, like, it just yeah. looks like they're actually getting hit exactly, in the face. Exactly, yeah. You know, contact's getting made here and there on sets. It does happen here and there. And what's interesting about this, like you said, I thought it was exciting. It's something I've never seen before. And like you said, like they're onto something. I think you're absolutely yeah. right. I think this is going to evolve into like a really effective way to do combat sequences. And they also, the stunt team, Warren, the, the stunt performers, the stunt actors, and the actors, Jake Gyllenhaal, they they studied bar fights. They studied what what do bar fights look like? What's it actually look like to be in that situation? And, you know, the form's not going to be perfect. It's going to be erratic. You can use objects around you. Just try to make it realistic to what a bar fight could actually be because there's so many in this movie. And when you're a bouncer, you're breaking up bar fights. Obviously, it's glamorized to make it seem like these are intense situations <laughs> with, like, one verse, one v 5 which I'm sure does happen. And I'm sure there's some bouncers out there that could really beat the fucking shit out of some people. But I thought it was really interesting. And also... What was I just about to say? I'm sure it was going to be great. It was going to be but great. But I thought, uh, to bounce off that, I thought it was so cool, the the Florida Keys vibe. It just kind of had a Wild West vibe to it where there seemed to be, like, 
an, a mad like a, a wildness to the to the people there of getting in all these fights like the bands that play at the bar there's a <laughs> fence protecting them and the, the crowds are so rowdy and i was and, like would i play there if i was a musician but at the end of the day a gig's a gig yeah so you gotta take it there was a funny shot after the one of the big fights and the bar was empty and like messed up and then the band's still playing i thought that was really funny and so i loved how they established this world where it's like uh, the, the law doesn't really have a thing out here because most of the cops are corrupt, and so it seems like a lot of people think know they can get away with things like this in this area. And the tone, like we go to go back to earlier, was a bit off. The story's nothing new; it's nothing crazy. Like we have a bouncer coming in, like you said, cleaning up the town, and you know, like a washed up guy is a former UFC fighter, and we find out in the backstory, which they filmed at a UFC event, I think it was two fifty eight or two eighty five. Jake, we remember all these behind-the-scenes photos of him at that event, and they were filming a movie, and this was like four months ago. Yeah. And the character, um, what happens is in his past, I thought we were going to get more UFC fighting in this movie I, rather than just a memory and flashbacks of his nightmares of fighting one of his best friends in the octagon and killing him. And, you know, it's a lethal sport. Things happen. You know, it's very violent. And the character has been going through this. He obviously hung up his gloves. He quit fighting. He's just kind of coaxing place to place. Who knows how long he's been traveling the world, basically. Traveling like Kane. States. Yeah. I'm just going to walk the earth. Exactly. Like Kane and Kung Fu. I thought we'd get more UFC fighting in terms of like him in actual matches. I thought based off the trailer that he was going to be a bouncer who was basically trying to be a UFC champion. That's what I thought the story oh. was going to be. Maybe I, I looked. I didn't look too closely at the trailer. When I watched the trailer, I was like, oh, he killed a guy in the ring, and so he he was probably disbarred from UFC, is my guess. And then he became a bouncer. Gotcha. I guess I just didn't look at the trailer closely. Because I, I try did not you, to— Did you skim it? I do these days, because I don't want to see the whole fucking movie in the trailers these days. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm going to see the whole movie, so I, I do skim trailers. That's I will the say, this, honestly, probably the best part of the film was the opening. It was pretty good. I thought the opening Wait, was great. in terms great. of the, the underground fighting? Yeah, the underground fighting, because— uh, if it opens with Post Malone in a in an underground brawl, and and he he knocks out some guy, and he's he's probably like the fourth or fifth guy Posty has taken out, and then Posty, Posty. <laughs> <laughs> and so Jake walks, uh, Dalton walks in as the next contender, and then Posty's like, no way, I'm fucking fighting that guy, no fucking way, I'm fighting that guy, and so he leaves the ring, making Dalton the winner of the night, and he he collects this big bag of uh, he just he collects that money. Without having to even throw a fight, a punch. So I thought that was really smart to show how dangerous the guy was and how feared he is in the ring, especially in combat, without even showing a fight. Like, I think it was it's a no-brainer to open the film with a fight, but I think to open it with a non-fight actually really worked storytelling-wise for me. Yeah, I thought it was interesting because you don't have to show how tough someone is through fighting. You yeah. can just do it from things like that. Intimidation. The, the, the yeah. fear that they instill in other characters in the story. And so. Dalton has, like, this, like, very... Monk like, vi just vibing kind of attitude the whole time. It was odd. Yeah, it was kind of weird. If it was weird because so in Roadhouse the original Swayze he has a similar thing, but he goes off on these like monologues, um, about life and about spirituality, and so he goes off on he really like lets you know who he is and how he thinks and um, how he lives his life um, through his through his speaking, but Dalton is a very silent person and. He's just like I just kept saying the whole time we were watching the film. Jake's just vibing. He was just he was just chilling the whole Wearing time. Cool shirts. He's in just, Florida Keys, a beautiful part of the world. Filming. He gets stabbed in the stomach. Just chilling. Like just let me just like duct tape it. I'm fine. <laughs> it's no big deal. I've been here before. It was a weird. It was a weird tone to the film, and it took a while to like get used to it. With and it was I mean it's just an odd tone, and then it it turned into something a little darker. At the end of the second act, and it, in my opinion, got a lot better and a lot more interesting. Oh, so you thought it was interesting. Obviously, we're getting into spoiler territory here. So after he starts taking over this club in terms of being the bouncer, and he gets hired by Frankie to be the bouncer there because she's dealing with so much trouble, so many people roughhousing and getting fights there. She can't operate the business. It's a family-owned business, generational business. She's kind of trying to keep it afloat. Goes out to find him, brings him to the, the bar, and unfortunately for him, for her, his car gets hit by a train. <laughs> so I guess I fucking should go to the Keys. I gotta go to the Florida Keys right now and get this job. And But then it takes a turn where um, Dalton's getting involved with local crime. And the girl he's seeing who's the nurse, her father is the sheriff who's involved with the son 
of a drug tr- smuggler. Yeah, Ben. Ben Brady. Ben, who's, who's great in, in No Time to Die. He's Billy like, Magnuson. He's a, he's a great vet, a yeah. villain. He's, he's got a, a ridiculous haircut. He's got a, like mohawk. A, it's yeah. like a, a, a fuckboy mullet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's really great. And then we just get into like drugs territory, smuggling territory. And then it's like, oh, what kind of movie is this? What is, but it felt like, what does this movie want to be? Does it know what it wants to be itself? Because it, at first I thought it was a little bit of abrupt to go into this drug territory. I was kind of anticipating. I was expecting it. It felt like it was going to go into that territory of drug smuggling or something like that. Because yeah. obviously it's a border state and smuggling has been going on around the f- southern Florida forever, you yeah, know, yeah, for the last yeah. hundred years. So I figured it'd go in that direction and it did. But it, it felt a little off when it did. But it worked for me in the end eventually. So when you say the, the film didn't seem to know what it was or what it wanted, that's... That's the error. That's the error of the writing. So the problem, the biggest problem with the film is, you don't know what Dalton wants. You don't even, and you don't even know what the villains want. You don't even know what Ben Brandt wants until an hour into the movie. Yeah, and then we find out that he's trying to build a resort. Yeah. And so, and trying, and the, the roadhouse is the last holdout. And that's a big problem when you're writing a story. If you don't, if the audience doesn't know what your characters want, that's a that's like rule number one. Your character needs to want something, and then there are obstacles stopping them from getting that done. There are challenges. There are people in conflicts that are trying to prevent them from achieving what they want. In this film, you don't even know what Dalton wants. And still at the end of the film, you don't really know what he wants. And you're, it's it's a big problem if you don't even know what your, what your villain wants. And so for, for an hour of the film, we were like, what exactly is this? What's going on here? I think it's because this movie went through a lot of rewrites. And it's been in development since November 2013. MGM began developing the film with Rob Cohen directing and Michael Stokes writing. Then in 2015, Cohen and Stokes had vacated the project, so they wrote a script, then vacated. While mixed MMA, well, MMA fighter Ronda Rousey, who was on top of the world back then, was cast in the lead role with filming projected to begin sometime the following year in 2016. However, the following month after that, Nick Cassavetes boarded the film as writer and director, so they were going to rewrite the script again. Then in November 2015, Ronda was defeated by Holly Holm, her first time losing an MMA fight, and the project was put on hold until November 2021. They finally rebooted it at MGM, and they began in another attempt to make this film with Jake Gyllenhaal set to star, and then they brought in Doug Lyman, who obviously is such a great director, and he worked with... Um, who did he work with? Oh, no, no, he worked with Jake... He hasn't worked with Jake at all. No, uh, he think. was doing Everest when he signed That's on. That's what it was. With uh, Josh Brolin okay, and cool. a bunch That's of other actors. Um, and so a search for a new writer to begin revisions on the previous g- previous drafts by Anthony Bagarozzi and Chuck Mondry began. And then Sheldon Turner turned in a rewrite of the script in 2022. And even though he did the final version, Bagarozzi and Mondry still received a screenwriting credit. So... There's like eight writers and filmmakers that have been attached to this project over the last 10 years. So I think that's why the script, they probably took pieces from that one, pieces from this script, and sort of maybe jumbled it all together to kind of keep one cohesive story that they were going with. What's odd is um, these writers have very little experience. So Anthony Bag- Bagarossi, uh, the most prominent writer on the film, he just had a writing credit on The Nice Guys before this, and that's almost 10 years ago. That's 2016. The nice guys yeah, came out. Yeah, a long out. time ago. Uh, Charles Chuck Mondry. This is his first feature credit uh, as a writer. Uh, R. Lance Hill. This is. Oh, he's the original writer of the original film, so we got a credit for. It. And so, but 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 that's it. Yeah. yeah. So characters. So these yeah. guys. I'm not sure how they got this gig. I like, you just know somebody. You probably, yeah. You probably had been script doctoring. You know. Yeah, and that's. I mean, that's the that's what held the film back because they're. The thing with Roadhouse, there's a great movie in there. It could have been fun. And let's not, let's not act like the original is a great film. Yeah, I know, I know. It's the, sort of like the, a cult classic kind of. The original it's, it's like is a, fine. It's a guilty pleasure movie. It's not an all-time film. Yeah. It's cool. Swayze's very cool in it. But like, let's not pretend like the original Roadhouse, it, like this this movie did it any shame because that movie is like not even that great. It's just, yeah, like you said, a guilty pleasure I mean, Roadhouse, the original. What? Yeah, it's Swayze with his shirt off doing kung fu in the backyard. It's it's, 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 it's actually pretty cheesy. It's it, it's very cheesy. I mean, there's a car explosion that goes off a ramp. It, it's getting it gets nuts at times. Yeah. That movie. Yeah. It's an it's an '80s movie. It's off the rails. But the thing with this, it had a good it had a good idea. You know, Dalton, UFC fighter, kills someone, becomes a bouncer. That's a good setup for a Roadhouse remake. That's what got me so excited with the trailer. But it really was just the story and the characters and really not having much direction until like the second half of the film. 
Like if if we had, like because we don't find out until like an hour and a half in that that Brant's trying to I mean an hour in that Brant's trying to buy the, road the house. Roadhouse from Frankie, but like if if Frankie told Dalton that from the get go, okay we got stakes. Dalton really needs money. He we have his want, and we have the obstacle, the villains trying to stop the Roadhouse from being successful and then eventually trying to destroy it. That's all that should have happened within the first 20 minutes. But what happens is we don't get most of those reveals until an hour in. And so for a while, the movie's just like kind of on a standstill of Dalton just chilling, hanging out at the roadhouse, teaching a couple of the bouncers how to fight, just drinking co- um, uh, Cuban coffee. <laughs> and, and then like these random scenes with uh, Billy Magnuson on his yacht. And you don't even know r- really what's happening. And so that really – it's the screenplay that held the film back from being very good. And there's a co-lead problem too where I, yeah. thought, I thought Frankie would be the co-lead of this movie and maybe she's billed as that. But then halfway through the film, she kind of just disappears because then Ellie comes in who's the girl that Jake has started – who's met at the hospital. She's the nurse or the doctor. And, yeah, uh, she's a doctor, Played man. by Daniela Mel- <laughs> Melchior. <laughs> nice save. Melchior. And um, she basically takes over the movie from the co-lead perspective – and then Frankie, like, comes into the third act. Oh, I'm like, oh, I forgot about Frankie. Like, where's she been? <laughs> so it's like some characters come and go, even though they seem like the leads. And I, I thought the bookstore stuff was a little corny and cheesy. Like, Charlie's a sweet character and her father in the store. And he gives her, he gives them the briefcase full of money at the end of the movie. It had bad pacing. So It and, had bad pacing. Yeah, that was interesting. But it was, like, it was a little, a little too corny and cheesy. Yeah. It, was, it is what it is. It was camp at times. But again, like we said, it's not like it's rebooting an all-time classic film. Most people didn't even know that there was a Roadhouse movie until this movie went into development, probably. Yeah. It started filming last year, and everyone's like, oh my god, I can't believe it did disservice to the original. I thought it was a good time. It's just like, it could, like you said, there was a great movie in there. It's got great pieces. Yeah. Excellent components to it. And I think Conor McGregor, <laughs> I know I mean, he's getting a lot of hate and a lot of love online for this performance. I thought he was great. I mean, it's freaking yeah. Conor McGregor. He's just... <laughs> He's a cartoon character out there. He's just doing what he is. Yeah. It's who he is. I had, I'm fine with what Conor McGregor did. And the thing with Conor is, I think it was great to have an actual, you know, legit fighter. Yeah. Uh, a two-time, three-time champion at different well, to, at different weights in the UFC. Come and be in a film. He's he's a huge star. One of the biggest stars of the five, last five years, ten years when it comes to athletes. Insanely famous. Very successful. Knows how to fight. And has an experience with fighting in bars in his past as well. So he, he kind of brought that element to it as well as bringing great technique, great form, and great fighting to this movie. It's not the first time a, a real fighter's been in a movie, but this is his film debut. This is the first it's a big role movie too. he's ever been in. Yeah. And a lot of this dialogue is cheesy and corny, but that's what we love about those old 80s movies. Yeah. Is those lines are so cheesy and corny. We look back at them like, oh my God, that line's terrible, but it's so good. Villains say the worst lines. Yeah, yeah. like when they're fighting on top of the piano. And, and Jake's character, Dalton says, sounds out of tune. And then Connor hits him in the face, like, sounds good to me. It's yeah. like so, tr- it's so corny, but I was like, fuck it, it works. That made me smile. And honestly, he had a really good character entrance. Who knocks? Yeah, yeah knocks just being naked after being caught uh, ha- ha- with uh, a man's wife. And then he he walks out of the, the apartment in there in some small town in Italy. And he walks into a, a plaza and steals the clothes off of one guy. And then sets fire to the the food market, and it's mostly done in one take. I thought it was a fun intro because he's like, you, he's just ha- he's naked half the time, yeah. and you're, you're just following behind him with his ass out. And you're like, I was just like, when that happened, I was like, oh, this is what this movie is. <laughs> you have the main villain henchman naked for twenty two minutes of screen time right here. This is what the movie is. It's a very unserious movie. Yeah, it's if you're going to this yeah. movie with a critical lens, don't. Yeah. Once that scene happened, I was like. Okay, now this is starting to make more sense. Some of the comedy ended up working overall. I mm-hmm. think one of the goons, like, there's a character who was very, he's very funny. Oh, the small guy? The smaller yeah. guy. He's like, oh, I just, at the end, when he thought Dalton was going to kill him, he was like, I, I don't, please don't kill me. I just want to ride motorcycles. It's, it's tough to ride motorcycles by yourself in Florida. Yeah, <laughs> not in a gang. <laughs> <laughs> and Dalton, he's like, he looks heavy. The thing with Dalton is, like we were talking about earlier, he's just so nice at the beginning, even though, but it's because he's so good at fighting and I, he doesn't want to fight anybody. I don't think really, maybe he does. And it, it's a funny role where he's asking, Oh, is there a hospital close by? He's not, be, he's not trying to be a dick. He's like, you're going to go to the hospital. Like, is there a hospital nearby? Yeah. 
and then it comes across as confident, but actually it's, it's a practical approach, I would say, because he knows he's going to win the fight every time. And then he does flip a switch where after they burn down the bookstore, he becomes angry, and basically we have some dialogue from him talking to some of these goons that he's beating up and killing where he's like, you know, it takes a lot to get me angry, but when I do it, and when I do, it's tough to turn off. And he's sort of just a, a monster, sort of like a Terminator-esque killing machine, it seems like. And when he killed the guy by breaking his trachea and punching him in the throat and then leaving him in the pool, remember he kills that guy? I don't know how I felt about that. At first I was like, oh man, I didn't think he was going to kill anybody in this movie. And of course that guy deserved it. He tried to kill a little girl and burn down a building and kill her dad. So obviously, I mean, karma's coming for him. If you believe in that kind of revenge, his character clearly does, and it's just a movie. But also, I was like, I don't know how I feel about him killing. I thought that was the most interesting part of the film. Yeah, it, that's probably why. Yeah, that, it was a very interesting part for me, too. I honestly wanted more of that sooner. I thought he was going to go and kill everybody there. Yeah. But maybe maybe that just didn't make the cut. Maybe. Um, I think we needed more of that. Um, because once it took that turn, I was like, oh, shit. And then... And then he's like disposing of the body, and like you said, the other, the small henchman is like, "Hey, just please don't kill me." Oh, that body looks heavy. Yeah. I was like, "Oh, I was like, this actually is kind of working." Yeah, much better than it did before. It took it took like an hour to get to it working though. So like if that the, is the weird yeah. comedy tone to it, if that had started sooner, maybe within like forty minutes or so, it would have really helped the film. But none of that really started until like at least eighty minutes. But I did have some fun with this movie. Besides the fight sequences, I mean, the music was really great, and I think they did a great job Good needle drops. getting the feel and the culture of the Florida Keys. And so the music supervisor, Randall Poster, and director Doug Lyman, they worked to feature a variety of bands on the Roadhouse stage, aiming to give the music its own narrative within the film. This approach underscores the film's setting in the Florida Keys and adds a layer of authenticity to the Roadhouse atmosphere. So getting bands from that area with different sounds to what you would actually hear if you went to a bar or a mm -hmm. Roadhouse in the Keys, I think that was really effective. There's something that I wish that they didn't do it the way they did in the film, and it's the UFC um, pay-per-view fight where he kills his, uh, his friend in the ring what they did was they interspersed it throughout the course of the film in these tiny increments of memories. Either he's dreaming about it or thinking back on it. And you only got like 15 seconds or so each time. And I was hoping, I thought the film was going to open with that being the opening scene. That would have been a great opening scene. That would have been a great opening scene if it opened like, if they staged it so it was like an MMA fight and then he kills the guy in the ring. It's like a good, a cool five minute. So I, they they can only capture so much footage live at the event, at the actual UFC event. Yeah. Um. And my guess was they were gonna get what they could have coverage there, and they were probably filming the entire fight off on location, off location in a, in a studio. Yeah, they did. Yeah. I thought they were gonna have like an entire th that in entire sequence was gonna be like a five minute scene. Me too. And when when you learned w in the first act that we were just getting like little bits and pieces of it, that honestly I think was underwhelming. I think it would have been. Really fantastic if it opened with that fight. We felt the stakes. We felt him kill. We felt the loss and the grief that he felt and the regret that he felt in the ring. And we can better understand why he left, why he tried to kill himself, almost tried to kill himself with the train. And it would have, I think, helped improve the character tremendously. I agree. And so I, I, was, agree. I was bummed when we just kept getting these little bits throughout. I would have liked to see more. But the production design, I think, was really good. What's cool about this film in Roadhouse, the, the centerpiece of the production was the main Roadhouse set, the restaurant, the bar, designed by production designer Greg Barry, and then built from scratch from the ground up. Perhaps the greatest testament to the quality of the construction was the fact that the Roadhouse set, including its thatched roof, withstood the force of a hurricane, Hurricane Fiona, which blew through the Dominican Republic filming location in September 2022. Wow, well done. A lot of movies have been filming in the, in the DR lately. Um, the killer shot in the Dominican Republic too. So oh, yeah. a lot of movies have been moving down, going down there to shoot. No more Mexico. They're going to the DR. <laughs> yeah, DR, it's, it's a hot location right now. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful country. There's so many great places you can set up and, and shoot. And tax credits there, and it's a lot cheaper to film there too. So Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. I really liked it in the killer. I like the roadhouse. I like the, the hay walls and roof and stuff. And... I thought it was fun. It was cool vibes. That's it was what this movie vibes. was. Yeah, it was a good time. It was a good time for a also, watch party. It was fun. Can you believe Dalton's salary? What was 5, it? 5000 a week? Yeah, that's pretty good. Like, yeah. I'll go be a bouncer for 5000 Like, holy week. shit. How much do they make in there? How much are they? How much is Frankie pulling in to pay a bouncer 
uh, 20 grand a month. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, my God. I don't know why he was hesitating to take that offer. I know. That's some good money, man. He's getting stabbed at the end of, of fights that he doesn't do, but, yeah. like, for, like you don't have to get stabbed. Also, uh, the fights were great. I love the slap fight, that first fight against the, the biker gang. Uh, that was prob- that might have been my favorite fight. I thought that was really good. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a great um, introduction to the violence and the fighting style for the audience in that fight because it's, it's mostly done in um, a small number of takes with wide angles, and um, the, the team did a great job overall uh, of choreographing and performing that stunt. I, I really like that scene. And as an absurd third act, I mean, action-heavy, we have boat chases, a lot of CGI, <laughs> a lot of blue screens, and then we have the great final fight between Knox and Dalton, which I thought was really excellent, and especially when Knox uh, stabbed Dalton, and then Dalton ended up using that piece of wood to stab Knox, then take that piece, other piece of wood, and stab Knox again. But then the like he stabs Knox <laughs> like six times. Yeah. I thought it was sick. That was great. However, I wish there was more blood. And it seemed like a lot of the blood was CGI, CGI. and the sticks themselves were CGI. But I thought it still looked really cool. But uh, I wanted more blood. The there was just a little too much CGI for my liking in that fight, and it was mostly the transitions and these crazy camera whip pans. Where he would uh, whip around the two, the, the pair fighting, and it was just, um, it was too animated. And then also there were a couple transitions, one where Connor threw Jake over himself onto the floor, and it was like this just kind of awkward digital transition um, from one setup to the next setup. Um, it was just a little too much CGI that didn't quite look great. There was a great side suplex. I, I think that's what you would, call, I guess that's what you call it, where he. Took Dalton and put him over his shoulders, then did the sideways flip mm-hmm. over uh, down the stairs of the stage yeah. and landed on his back. Great stunts. Like, yeah. th- there's great stunt work in this movie. There's a couple, a couple of my favorite shots, though, of that final fight were just wides of Jake and Connor, just a very wide angle. Yeah. And they threw a couple of blows each, and those looked great. Yeah, it was like those, just a voyeuristic yeah. kind of shot. Those yeah. looked fantastic. And the, the movie did end up getting really big. There was a. Uh, that huge explosion on the yacht. Yeah. I was like, what's going on? I love how everyone's like, abandoned ship. It's going to sink. I'm like, it's eight feet of water. It's going to be okay, guys. Yeah, you, <laughs> you don't have to abandon you ship. Guys aren't you can just die. chill up there. Yeah, you aren't going to die. You aren't going to die. <laughs> I, I, w- I just would have liked it if, if Dalton killed every bad guy. Yeah, that would have been cool. I think that would have put the movie a little bit over the top. Because he only killed way. that one guy, and then he killed, right? He only killed one guy. Yeah. And then he killed Knox. I think if there was a fight scene where he, because we saw how good he was in the in that first biker gang fight, obviously holding back. But if they did a similar thing in the third act where he was confronted by the gang and he killed them all, that would have been fucking sick. That would have been, been really cool. cool. We yeah. should have we should have written this. Yeah. Overall, it's it's just because Jake is such a talented actor, yeah. and the rest of the cast is solid. But it's noticeable when you have someone as talented and as experienced as Jake, who's an all-timer. Like, he's a generational kind of guy and kind of actor. Everyone else did really well, too. But I think it's noticeable from the performances that he's just a standout at times. Yeah. But overall, I enjoyed Roadhouse. It was a good time. It's a classic kind of 80s movie feel. It did. It just it felt like an 80s movie. If and you're it was, being critical was... of this film... Get over, well, yeah, I mean, get over your, like I said, get, once once Connor movie. showed up naked, I was like, this it just clicked for me, and I was like, okay, this is what this movie is. It's yeah. just a fucking ridiculous action movie. Yeah, that's it, all it is. It was a good time. Um, but let us know what you think of Roadhouse in the comments on YouTube or in the prompts on Spotify. But how about we take our intermission? Let's do it. And then we'll get back to our episode and talk about Immaculate, the new film from, film from Neon, starring Sidney Sweeney. And before we continue, the best way to support Raiders of the Lost Podcast is, of course, to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Why would you want to? Like I said earlier, you can watch movies with us on Discord. It's an absolute blast. So sign up at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast today. Get all kinds of perks and merchandise and all sorts of goodies from Anthony and I and being an official part of the show, which we really love. Another great way to support the show is to leave those five-star ratings and reviews on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Those ratings and reviews get us seen by new listeners. We get bumped up in the charts because that's how you get charted, and that's how you do really well. That's how people discover your shows. If you have a lot of ratings at 5,000 Apple ratings, I'll get a tattoo of Anthony's Choice on my body somewhere, hopefully not embarrassing. So leave those five-star ratings and reviews. I'll get to one in just a moment. I'll read one off Apple. And another great way to support the show is to... Share us with your family and friends, your movie lover friends, your family members who enjoy film. Send them our show. Word of mouth is the best way for a podcast to grow, so we need your support and your help. Just share us with everybody. 
This episode, of course, is sponsored by our friends at MoviePosters.com, the number one place to get your posters online today. Be sure to use our promo code Raiders10 at MoviePosters.com to get 10% off your order right now. They have a huge selection of pretty much every movie and TV show imaginable in their poster library, as well as all sorts of sizes, framing, and even backlighting for your poster needs. If you are a fan of movies and you want to express that love, the best way to do that is with a movie poster. Or maybe there's a movie lover in your life. It's their birthday coming up. Maybe get them a movie poster of their favorite film or TV show. Do that at MoviePosters.com. And don't forget to use our promo code Raiders10 to get 10% off your order right now. Let's get into our intermission, everybody, and start with the movie quote competition. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready? That was Wicked Boston. It's Wicked, uh, Wicked Boston guy. Okay, here we go. If you've created a conscious machine, it's not the history of man. That's the history of gods. Ex Machina. Yes, sir. I did that because it's coming out in IMAX very soon. Nice, dude. And I can't wait. Nice, dude. Did you just call yourself a god? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love how later like, when you called me a god, it was crazy. Like, I never, I never did that. <laughs> All right, here's two people talking. Have I got things to tell you? What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. Huh. Do it one more time. Oh, boy. Have I got things to tell you. What happened? I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. I don't know. <laughs> it's some like it hut. Oh. <laughs> Jack Lemon accidentally he is a guy. They're dressing up as women to disguise themselves to yeah. hide from the mob. And uh, there's a guy who's obsessed with him, an older man. And he's like, <laughs> he wants to marry him. It's so funny. <laughs> Good one. Nobody's perfect. Nobody. It's the final line of the film. All right. Guess this movie released here, Anthony. You ready? Ready. Gattaca. 1997. 1997. It's correct. He's two for two, ladies and gentlemen. Two for two. What year did Sunset Boulevard come out? 1965. 1950. Holy shit. That's an old movie. Yeah. Oh, my God. I was way off. Yeah, you were way off. 15 years off. Anyways, let's forget about you that. You weren't even in the same ballpark. Let's forget about that. <laughs> Moving on to a movie pop quiz, Anthony. Who voices Princess Fiona in the Shrek franchise? That would be Cameron Diaz. Ding, ding, ding. He's three for three. Look at this guy. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. That's how it's done. Cameron. All right. What Billy Wilder movie did Audrey Hepburn star in? I did a Billy Wilder trivia set. I could tell. It's not my strong suit. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell you. Um, you want to take a guess? Is it going to be Roman Holiday? No. I don't know. Sabrina. Sabrina. Oh, Sabrina. Sabrina was the answer. Yes. All right. Anthony. Zero for three. <laughs> do we? <laughs> I'm sorry. I picked movies that have been made the last four years. Oh, okay. So what? You don't like old films? I don't. It's not that I don't like old films. I just don't know too much about the 1950s. All right. All right. I get it. But hey, I, Let's love, get into I, the love, to learn, I love to learn new things. You should watch some Billy Wilder movies. Maybe I will. Maybe you I should will. watch them. Maybe I will. You love them. I will. The apartment's great, too. I will. I'll check it out. I promise. All right. Dan wrote in our movie news episode, original office. I mean, original office. The U.S. office is not the original office, nor the best. Unsubscribed. <laughs> it is better. It I is disagree. better, Dan. And every English friend of I mine disagree. who has watched the American version of The Office, they agree. I've, tur I've turned them to the dark side. <laughs> Jeff Jeffrey Fro wrote, Not a Western fan, so I won't argue with your picks too much, but some of them may not be Westerns. My favorite is The Quick and the Dead. Sam Raimi's Western. Probably the best, case, best cast in a Western, too. It's got a great cast. Russell Crowe. Um, Sharon Stone, a bunch of great actors. Um, Luke DiCaprio's in it. And then Jeff then wrote, Oh, wait, you got my runner up in there. I'm your Huckleberry. Resubscribed. He did, he unsubscribed before that. <laughs> I'm your Sorry. Huckleberry. And then Ben Badger wrote in our Western episode, The inclusion of the underrated masterpiece, that is, the assassination of Jesse James, keeps me from unsubscribing. <laughs> and then Sean Brewer wrote, Signed up for a podcast on the top 20 best Western hotels. Then got stuck with a couple of Bostonians wearing cowboy hats. Unsubscribed. Looked good, didn't we? <laughs> God damn it. 10-gallon hat looked awesome. Thanks uh, for the uh, unsubscribe again. Yeah, you should wear it more often. It looks good. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Is that it? 
That's it. All right, we have a great five-star rating and review from Scott117. The Cohen Brothers of Podcasting. Fuck yeah. In 2023, I thought I was a film nerd. After listening, after a year of listening to these two, I realized I'll never come close. <laughs> but really, I have learned a ton from the show, found some of my new favorite movies, Coherence, anyone? And always have been, always have a good laugh while listening. In my opinion, best movie, TV, game, twin podcast around. Yes. Scott. Thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful five star written review on Apple Podcasts. We're the goaded twin podcast. We are the goaded twin podcast. Is there another twin podcast? There's gotta There's be. There's gotta be. There's gotta be. There's a podcast for everything now. This is a coffee mug podcast. Probably. We should listen to that. It's probably pretty good. <laughs> you can listen to it. It's not like we listen to everything together. <laughs> Anthony and I, we, well, the way you worded it, it's like we can't do anything without each other. No, no, because we, we don't do anything without each other. Anthony and I are like Pam and Jim in the office. <laughs> I wear one headphone, he wears the other a headphone. That's a lie. And it's just really great. We just listen to music in parking lots. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> and then recreate that in other movies. <laughs> <laughs> I did buy you a teapot. A teapot? Yeah. You bought me a teapot? Yeah, I bought that new black one a few months ago. Oh. I got it for you. Oh, you got it for me? Yeah. Because I wasn't really using it. I thought it was like a house gift. No, it was like, yeah, he could use a new teapot. Oh, that was really nice. Yeah. I had no idea that that was for me. I thought it was for both of us. I told you. I was, I was like, I got it for my guy. Oh, you, pro- wow. you probably thought I was joking. Wow. Yeah, I thought, I thought you were. No. Oh, my God. I'm like so touched right now. The other now. one was nasty. I was like, he could use it better. I'm so touched right now. <laughs> now we have an espresso, and I'm never going to yeah, use that teapot an- again. <laughs> well, I use it for tea. You know? True. It's good for tea. Nespresso machines tea are amazing. Oh, the Nespresso. The Virtual great. Plus. Oh, my God. Never going back. Never going back. All right. Speaking Never. of going back, let's go back into our episode. Well, what's your streaming recommendation? I forgot about that. My streaming recommendation. Hold on. I just exited it out of my Google Doc. Give me a one second to pull it. Oh, I know it. Off the top of my head. That's how good my memory wow. is. Wow. You know, that's how good mo- my There's a movie online you can watch. Wow. And I remember it. Well, it's called Kung Fury. Oh, yeah. You watched it last night? It's. It's really amazing. It was made in 2015, and it's only like 35 minutes. I had to rent it on Amazon. You can't really watch it anywhere else. And it's the most absurd homage to 80s movies in the history of cinema. It's basically the the, the most silly, campy thing I've ever seen in my life. And they had a pretty decent budget, so basically this is my three-star review on Letterboxd. And three stars, like, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> Are you interested in watching a kung fu cop shoot two handguns simultaneously at an arcade machine monster while standing on top of a Ferrari that is flying in the air after hitting a jump going 100 miles per hour, then Kung Fury is for you. <laughs> it's basically about this cop who's a Kung Fu cop. He gets struck by lightning while he's fighting a Kung Fu master and gets these incredible Kung Fu powers and abilities, and he becomes like a Kung Fu cop in the big city, and he's like the ultimate <laughs> cop. He's like a superhero. He talks like this. It's super funny. And all the audio is ADR. It's, clearly, it's, it's so good. So then he... Um, has to travel back in time to defeat Hitler and kill Hitler once and for all. And, but then he travels too far back in time and goes into a prehistoric Viking age that travels forward in time with the help of Thor back to the present day <laughs> after killing Hitler once and for all and then coming back and saving the day from a, a, a arcade monster, arcade mm-hmm. machine monster. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. It's super fun. There's a lot of guns. Sounds like a pretty simple script. It's pretty, pretty ridiculous. straightforward. It's so ridiculous, but it's it's really excellent. I remember I watched it years ago when it came out. But then I never watched the second one. The second one never got released. Oh, no. So Fastbender is in it. Michael Fast Fastbender's in it? Not, it never got released. So Michael Fastbender's in Kung Fury 2. So is an Arnold Schwarzenegger. And Aiza Gonzalez, which was originally cast in it. However, she, she got replaced by another actress. And so they shot the movie in 2018. They filmed it. Kung Fury 2 has been filmed. However, post-production has halted it from going any further because there's a lawsuit between the filmmaking team and the investors on the project. So that's Holy how this shit. is sort of like a cult movie, Kung Fury. Fastbender and Schwarzenegger are in it, and they filmed it. Are you serious? They just can't release it. In 2018, they filmed it. I had no idea. Wow. Holy and shit. And David Hasselhoff. Hasselhoff's in the original. Wow. It's a pretty crazy story. Oh, yeah. Holy shit. He's got a mustache. Fast Fast Bender? Yeah. I got to look at the image of him. There's no actual image, but there's an image with him behind the scenes offset, and he's got a mustache. Oh, my God. Wow, that's too bad. Yeah, it would have been a legit uh, theatrical release, too, I think. I mean, if you get those actors, yeah, people, you want to release it theatrically. 
Wow, it never released. It's too bad. Maybe it'll get released one day, but I doubt it. At this point, it probably never will be. And the guy who made it never made anything else? No, I don't think so. He probably just got sued like crazy for something. Yeah. Who knows what happened on set? That's just the only thing I know is that there was a lawsuit between the investors and him. Damn, too bad. Well, damn. <laughs> Sucks. What a bummer, because I would love to see it. So, legal malpractice lawsuits. Hmm. That's very nonspecific. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. We'll never know. Oh, well, it's too bad. Too bad. All right, uh, what was your stream react? I recommend Some Like It Hot. It's on Max. You should watch it tonight. Maybe I will. It's got Marilyn Monroe in it. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Yeah. Maybe I will. All right. Let's get back into our episode. And now we're going to talk about the new film new film from Neon and director Michael Moen, Immaculate, starring Sidney Sweeney, written by Andrew Lobel. Immaculate right now, which is just releasing in theaters on IMDb, is a 6.3. Ron Tomatoes is a 70% critic score, 59% audience score. Letterbox is a 3.1. Kind of close to the scores of Roadhouse, yeah, to be honest. Pretty, yeah, pretty much the same. It's about Cecilia, a woman of devout faith and nun, or about to be a nun, is warmly welcomed to a picture-perfect Italian countryside convent where she is offered a new role at the illustrious convent. But it becomes clear to Cecilia that her new home harbors dark and horrifying secrets. This film stars Sidney Sweeney as Cecilia, Alvaro Morte, Benedetta Porcaroli, Dora Romano, Giorgio Congeli, and Simona Tabasco, who you might recognize from The White Lotus as Sister Mary. And this movie, I think we... I That's think why she got a round of applause yeah. when her name came up. Yeah, she's, she's popular <laughs> from that show. Now, we saw this movie at a special early, early screening in Hollywood at an actual church, which was a really cool event. They had, you know, a bunch of characters in costumes, a bunch of actors there with the nun outfits and everything. It was a really creepy way to watch the film. It was, it was actually a good time, and Sweet, Sydney Sweeney was there. She introduced the film. This is a movie that she auditioned for back in 2014 with Michael Mohan, but the project had never materialized until recently, and years later, she took on the role of producer and reached out to the, to the writer, acquired and revised the script, hired a director with Michael Mohan, found financiers, and sold the film to Neon. And it's been revealed recently in interviews that she was able to do this because she did movies like Madam Web and No Hard Feelings. And she said she took those movies because it gave her producing power, which is a really smart move. Now she gets to kind of make mo make movies that she really wants to do and make her own career path, which was you know a very good marketing and, and career decision from her. Yeah, Immaculate was uh, an interesting experience, especially because we watched it in a church, and it was just... It was weird. <laughs> it was weird to watch that movie there. In that it was very sacrilege. Yeah, it felt sacrilege, um, especially because it was a giant crucifix right above the screen. <laughs> that being said, so I'm not a fan of this film. What'd you give it for a letterbox rating? I think I gave it a three. Let me double check. I gave it a two and a half. Um, I just I was not a fan of the film, and the reason why I didn't love the film is because it's not a horror movie. It's not really scary. Yeah, and, I gave it a three. Yeah, and it was just. Pretty underwhelming. There were some really good aspects to it. I think the cinematography was really nice. Uh, the score was really good. And um, as we were talking about, most of the cast is Italian, speaking Italian, which is cool. Quite a bit of Italian is spoken. Um, the, uh, the supporting cast, for the most part, very good. And just overall, a cool tone, pretty good editing, um, an interesting approach. I like the first five minutes a lot. Uh, I that was like my favorite part of the film was the first the setup, and then it just kind of overwhelmed us with just like a monotonous story of not really anything happening. And then it had a third act that was very propulsive. Uh, but overall, I found the film just to be very so so. Honestly, I thought there were a lot of pros and cons to it. I think obviously a pro is it's, is in Rome. They filmed yeah. in Rome in beautiful locations. And when you're filming in Italy, which a lot of movies are, it's hard <laughs> for it not to look good. And the cinematography and the production design, which they probably didn't have to do too much of because they were filming in beautiful interiors and these beautiful churches and, and chapels and, and buildings and, and mansions and estates in Italy. So gorgeous locations, beautiful cinematography, wardrobe, costume design. Everything was solid. Uh, I really liked the final scene. 
And I thought they got creative with the mild nudity. You know, mild nudity is something that used to be a norm in horror films, and it sort of is there here and there. So this is PG-13? I believe it's R. Let me double check. Immaculate is an R. Okay, it's an R. It's got to be an R with that final scene. Yeah. Like, no fucking way. Yeah. It'd be PG-13. So I think it it was really effective with their nudity, which wasn't complete nudity. It was just creative, like, through clothing kind of thing in water. So I, I thought that was cool as well as, but like I agree with the cons, not scary. I thought it was gonna be a scary movie, mm-hmm. but really, I think there were five jump scares that were just like with loud noise and a, 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 yeah. a track of just like two seconds of music. No, just cheating, just like oh, let's drop the audio down to silence, and then we'll just do a bang of an audio track, like a bird flying into yeah. a window, or just like a. Character. Or every time a door opened, it was like <laughs> every door for some reason. Yeah, so it, I thought it was gonna be scary. I thought the trailer looked like it was going to be a scary movie, but it wasn't scary at all, to be honest. Yeah. Now, I was disappointed by the fact that I felt no fear in this movie at all. I think that one of, his, one of its greatest strengths was something they sort of abandoned, and that's the unique idea. You know, it's about Immaculate Conception, and I'm going to spoil the film right now, so if you have not seen Immaculate yet, I recommend, you know, maybe not listening to the rest of the episode because I'm going to explain how the Immaculate Conception happens in this film. So obviously Immaculate Conception happens where they take one of the nails that had nailed Jesus to the cross and they discover DNA on it. Obviously, once technology had become more advanced in the 20th century and for years now, they've been trying to use the DNA they found on the cross of Jesus Christ to create a new baby, a new savior of the Christian religion, basically. Or and try to recreate somebody or being of God through somebody through immaculate conception, but not through spirituality or through God, but immaculate conception through science, which I thought was a really clever idea. I thought it was going to be an immaculate conception movie, and I thought it was going to be a demon. I thought it was going to be like the son of the devil, which I was expecting would have been better. It might it might would have been yeah. it might have been better even if it would have been predictable. It would have been too much like Rosemary's Baby. But I think that's the greatest strength of the movie besides the locations and the aesthetic is the concept's really unique. That's a good fucking idea for a movie, if you ask me. I think it's a really clever idea. However, like you said, it takes a while to get to what is going on. Even though there are hints here and there of what might be going on, the first 40 minutes, it is very boring outside of some... Well, not very boring. It's boring sometimes outside of what happens in the horror elements of it, of people being tortured, these secret nuns and these red masks kind of going around and torturing people who go out against the convents who are trying to escape. You hear stories of the past, which begs the question, why do they keep asking people to come here? Obviously, they're trying to immaculate conceive over and over again with people taking their rights as a nun. But I, for the first half of the movie, I, I found myself, you know, a little bored at times with the film because the writing's not terrific at times. The dialogue, and like you said, they're just kind of walking around in rooms, and it's just, eh. It's, it's not it's, much it, happening. Is anything going to happen at yeah. some point? And it wasn't interesting dialogue. Yeah, this is, I mean, the it, the setup is interesting. Um, the problem is, like, it doesn't have, like, why does it have to be a nun that's con- that gets the conception? Um, I think that's just more likely that a, a, a woman of age would be a virgin still if she was a nun is my guess. Yeah, that's, I think they need they wanted yeah. a virgin. Yeah. So so it didn't cuz they're trying they're cry, they're trying to recreate the Immaculate conception so yeah. they need a virgin. No, no, I understand that. Yeah, I understand that. But I'm just saying like it didn't have to be a nun. Um but that's obviously what they're they were going for like oh it's more likely that a woman who's 20 who hasn't had sex it's more likely they're extremely devout um Christian. Or a nun. Or well, speaking of de- devotion to religion and faith, or whatever religion it is, I didn't really feel that with the character played by Sydney Sweeney, who plays uh, a young woman. Her name is Sister Cecilia, and she's doing her rites at the convent, and she's supposed to be of devout faith, but I never really felt that. I, I never felt like she was devoted to religion. I didn't feel that with anyone in the film, honestly, except for the, the main priest. So I, one of the, my biggest issues with the film is, so they had this really great set, this beautiful building, and they had great costuming and everything so you you want to get the audience to fall into this world to immerse themselves in the world and i'm watching this film and this is supposed to be a convent but not a single prayer was said that i could see there are prayers i mean there are prayers but like there wasn't even a mass it didn't feel like anybody was really doing anything like well there's the mass for the 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 rights rights, but that's basically it um and most of the time there was just really nothing happening 
in Sydney Sweeney's character, Cecilia, her friend just like folded towels for five minutes. Well, and, they're there. They're helping the yeah. elderly. So no, yeah, yeah, it's a convent. I know, I know, but they do the more. It just didn't feel like I was giving get, getting enough of, of the, what the convent life was like. Mm. There are other films that have come out recently that really like showcase like oh what that what that culture is they like. They did that quick montage. Yeah, exactly. It was a quick little montage with like very positive music. And one I was, of the elderly woman died. Yeah, it, it felt off. So a movie like Delt with Amy Adams in Meryl Streep showcase the culture really well and you got to understand like what the days day in day out routines are like and what it's like to really live that life they did a great job in that film as well as benedetta from paul before hooven who came out which came out two years ago which is very good yeah um i just didn't really get a sense for the culture and on top of that um so the big bad of the movie i predicted the moment we met him being the 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 father when that father showed up i was like that's gonna be the villain Mm mm-hmm and so when it was real that he was like a mad scientist priest who has been carrying out this huge experiment trying to get the, the conception to work, um, I was just like, that. I guess that when, when he showed up on screen for the first time. So um, things about the film were just too easy to predict. I knew where it was going to be going. Um, and I just didn't quite feel, like you said, Cindy Sweeney's performance as Cecilia, she did not feel like she was someone who had devoted her life to, to a, a religion. And she, she can emote really well, and she can cry. She she can scream. She has those parts of her utility belt as an actor. This is the first time I've seen her like actually perform in a movie or a TV show. I've just seen bits and pieces of Euphoria, and she's only in like a minute of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. She's barely in it, uh, so you can't really say that. Yeah, she's at Spawn Ranch. Yeah, she you can't really say that's a showcase of her acting. So this was her big thing for me as an audience. Uh, member to see her and i was for the most part pretty underwhelmed based upon how how much she's been blowing up and how big she's getting and she really just felt like she just seemed like a girl from la honestly the whole time and she's sold on sydney sweeney i thought she was really great i it was the first time i really seen her in anything mm -hmm. because i've never actually watched euphoria i didn't watch madam webb so for me to watch her besides clips I thought she was excellent. So I, th- I think she's a star for sure. I think she's well. Gonna... She's a star, yeah. No, but I mean, like, she's gonna be like a huge yeah. star. I'm not. Sh- I'm not sold on her. I'm. I'm really not sold on her. And this performance, I wasn't really captivated or blown away at all. It's... We can agree to disagree. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. We're gonna disagree because she, like I said, when it got crazy, she can do it. When she, if she has to cry, she can do it. But I'm talking about the the performance of you know the back and forths of dialogue, the characterization. Um, it just, I was just. It was not what the film needed. I think. I think it needs. She it needs a little bit more characterization. I think it's just the writing. No. I think at the end of the day, same thing with Roadhouse. The weakness of the movie is the writing, the screenplay. True. I mean, she didn't really have anything interesting. That's what to I mean. Say, it's not, it's for, not Sydney's fault that the script doesn't have things for her to say or do. That's interesting. For I will her, say storytelling. Most of her dialogue is just responses. Yeah. 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 Um. So I think it's just the script did her a disservice. Maybe the story it's possible. Yeah. I think that's for me. That's the weakness because I thought the directing was solid. I thought the acting was solid. I thought I, everything about this movie was solid except for I think the writing held it back. And But there are a couple things that I will say that I think it's just trying to cash in on popular motifs in mm-hmm. recent entertainment as well. So obviously, Rosemary's Baby is the first thing that comes to mind. But then Squid Game, I think they're trying to cash in on the Squid Game aesthetic with the nuns with the red masks, which really... Obviously, they do some torturing here and there, and it's messed up what happens to the sister with her tongue getting cut off and then being – obviously, she yeah. discovers her in the uh, catacombs. So I think they're trying to cash in on the Squid Game aesthetic and look. And then Ready or Not. You know, Ready or Not, spoiling that movie right now if you haven't seen it. At the end of that movie, we have our main character, our, our lead, our final girl, just like the final girl in this film – survives she's wearing a white dress and she's covered in blood that's the last aesthetic of the movie Mm -hmm. what happens at the end of this movie our final girl white dress covered in blood i thought they were trying it just kind of for me i was like oh they just did that recently oh that's something very recent so it kind of instead of trying to have its own identity it was taking bits and pieces from different parts of entertainment whether it's tv or film recently and kind of putting it in there to make it all sort of like a really interesting idea i think referencing movies in in Stealing isn't the right word, but lifting images. Yeah, or, I'm not saying stealing. No, yeah, from movies is is great, but I think there is there sh- there is a recency thing where you got to give a movie a little bit of life to live in the world before you can really just like pull a shot from it. Mm-hmm. And I mean Tarantino, Wes Anderson, 
lift images and scenes and movies from lots of films, but they're very old films. And so they give uh, the audiences a new look at something they've probably never seen before. And I, I totally agree with you. I think it was just like it just felt like the same shot. And we just saw it in a really beloved horror movie recently. So yeah. And I love the final scene. Honestly, yeah. I thought it was the best part of the movie was the final scene. It's a long take. It's like two minutes long where Sydney Sweeney's character, Sister Cecilia, gives birth and then goes over, is disgusted by what she just gave birth to. It's probably a monster, a little, maybe not a demon, but just like non-human looking being. Goes over, gets a boulder, and then smashes it. It's like two or three minutes long. I yeah. thought it was fucking awesome. I love the ending of this movie. That's why I think there was a great movie in here. Just like Roadhouse, there's yeah. a great movie in there. It's just the script held it back. And um, they set up a, a couple of interesting creative ideas. Uh, she's... Her body's deteriorating. She pulls off a fingernail, but they could have gone further with that. Yeah, pukes a tooth. Yeah, she pukes up a tooth, but that should, we should have gotten more of that. Because then after that, we never saw her body really deteriorate again. So it was just like, what was the point of that? And then also, there are a couple of dream sequences. I think it's a given. Horror movies often capitalize on you know a crazy dream sequence that really doesn't have any bearing on the plot. But it's a cool moment. And there were a couple of those. They were very short, but... It, this didn't seem like it really added anything or was really necessary. It was just like, oh, let's get a cool 30-second, super scary, visually stunning sequence in here. Um, I'm all for it when it works for the story and adds to the story. But then in this one, it just felt like it was done just to do it. Like, like there's a, that shot of, like, the hands pulling at her face. Yeah. Cool shot, but I was like, what is this? Like, it, it, it's, it cut and she woke up, and I was like, it's not like the nuns actually did that to her face. Like it didn't make doesn't make much sense, but it's a cool image. But if it doesn't, if it's not adding to the story, I think it's do we really need that in the film? And then also establishing these murderous nuns with the red masks. Okay, cool. You got you got this like cool henchmen vibe going of these villains in the in the convent. But then what happens in the third act? Non participants. Yeah, they're just singing. The they're all singing in the, the foyer. The non participants. They're just gone. So you have like this violent. Arm, and you have an army of nuns. Yeah, you have an <laughs> army of these violent, killing, torturing nuns. But it just happens to be that the finale takes place on this night where they're all outside singing for, I guess, an, over an hour to allow Cecilia to escape. So you establish this. If, you, if you're going to establish these like brutal, violent villains and then not use them in the third act you're cheating you're, it's just it's, it's just not it's cheating a, it's, a cop it's, just, out. it's just plot armor. i call it i call plot it cheating armor. it's not plot cheating. armor's cheating it's not cheating it's cheating it's such a strong word dude well plot armor is the same thing no it's not it's not cheating you can it's, you can write a story and not be cheating well i think it's a form of cheating i don't think it's a form of cheating how is it not how is it cheating because you're you're saying that the rules that you established they're not there anymore it's not cheating it's just convenient Extremely convenient. It's convenient writing. Yeah. It's not. You're not what are you cheating? You're not cheating off a test. You're not cheating somebody for money. You just. You just. You know. It's just. It's not strong writing. It's not cheating. It's a form. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying you're cheating. I just off think a test. cheating is a strong word to use. Really? You think that's armor. a strong word for plot armor? Yeah. I think plot armor is a form of cheating. I look at it I as think a strong word for it. No, I don't. I, think I, it, I wouldn't call it cheating. Don't worry. No one's getting offended, man. I'm not. I'm not worried about someone getting offended. I think words are important, though, and I don't think it's cheating. I'm just saying. I, I disagree. I don't think it's cheating. I think plot armor is a form of cheating to get to the finale without really, without really get, getting it right. It's just you, you're you're, taking, you're, you're just skipping a, little, a few steps. You know, it's <laughs> it's like an easier way out. It's an easy yeah. way out. It's not cheating. It's a cop it's just, out. It's just the easy. Okay, route. it's a cop out. Cop out. I'm just, it's the easy route. I'm gonna go with that. It's the easy route to the finish line. It's not a cop out. It's not cheating. It's just. It's, 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 How's it not a cop out? It's not that big of a deal. <laughs> you have villains that didn't even show up in the end. We have the main villain. Yeah, one of them. The main villain. She kills yeah. one, two people, and then yeah. there's a main villain. Yeah. So it's not a cop out. It's just the easy route to the finish line. Okay. That makes you sleep better at night. It does. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> harsh, <laughs> harsh critic Anthony over here. Hey, I'm just being honest, man. Yeah, I get it. I, I was just, it. I was just really like, where are all these people? Where are where is everyone? Well, we got a shot of where they were, and it wasn't there. <laughs> they was nowhere near. Well, I just got the craziest feeling of of um, like what was it called? Deja vu. Deja vu. Whoa, just now. Did you just dream this? No. Yeah, I think so. I, this whole moment, I feel like I just got deja vu. You just you dreamed it like a, a year ago, like ten years ago. Weird. 
You were was it an immaculate dream? I just got intense deja vu. Where you am okay? I? Maybe I did do a line of blow. I don't know. You did or you seemed earlier like you did a line of blow. I was just hyped up, man. I was ready to you go. You were doing kung fu moves. I was I didn't do a kung <laughs> fu move. It was a showman move. It was a show like a showman. You've never done that before. Yes, I have. Never. Yes, I have. You were like, it was like you you took a shot of adrenaline. Maybe I did. Welcome back to Raiders of Lost Podcast, everyone. The greatest showman. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was like Dark Diggler. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a star. I'm, I'm a, a star. star. I'm a bright, shining star. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Just bringing the energy, bro. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot of energy. No, it was good energy. It was good energy. Yeah, it was. Uh, so I know I'm being criti- I know I'm being critical of the film and of Sydney Sweetie, but I will say she committed. She gave it her all. You know, she definitely did. It's not like she. I, I, she did. She put it all in there. And also, she built this movie, helped it even come to fruition. So she made this movie happen 100 percent this movie wouldn't exist if it wasn't for her I think Sydney Sweeney is a star she's a star a bright shining star she's a star she's a star I thought she was great in this movie I mean verdicts out not out I'm for me sold yet. on Sydney I'm sold I think you were sold hello before. Sydney <laughs> you, you were sold before hello, I played hello Sydney <laughs> I like Sydney Sweeney and immaculate so what's your what's your feeling on jump scares are you just tired of seeing them I'm, I hate jump scares to be honest yeah. Unless it's creative. There there are creative ways to do jump scares, but a bird hitting window, people walking in the frame, I'm sick of it. I'm really sick so of jump scares. So here's the thing. You, you could do the bird hitting the window, but maybe do something else again after that and build off of it. Like you two birds hitting like, the window. Maybe you have three birds yeah, hitting the window. I mean, that'd be interesting. <laughs> but like, just a bird randomly flies in the window, and then we never see another bird again. Like, is it Jesus trying to, God trying to kill yeah. Sydney sweet Sister Cecilia? And then like, there's, there's a shot where she grabbed a knife, but slid it against the table, and it was so loud. And the person next to me jumped from it. It's yeah, like the, it's yeah, like the right. sound design is what's scaring you. It's yeah. not scaring you. It's jolting you. Yeah. It's it's it, it's jolting. See, that's that's a good use of wordage right yeah, there, man. Jolting. Yeah. It's, you're not being scared. You're being jolted. Like, oh fuck. It was more. It's more shock than scare. You know what I mean? Yeah. And also, like, they should have just had her body like deteriorate more. It would have been way more interesting. Yeah. But overall, I thought it was a pretty good movie. I thought it was solid. It's all right. I thought it was it's solid. It's all right. I I. I enjoyed this film. At the end of the day, I liked it. I was very satisfied with the ending. I thought it was an awesome third act. I really did. Honestly, the popcorn was fantastic. That popcorn night. was fantastic. It was very it was buttery. It's a cool experience. It's a cool experience. So, I mean, if you listen to this full episode, you've probably seen Immaculate. If not, recommend checking it out because it's a pretty good time. I think it's going to be a hit. You know, it pulled $5 million in its first day at the box office on a $9 million budget. I thought that was the weekend gross. I just read that. It was its opening day. I'm pretty sure that was the weekend. No, it was five million domestic weekend, but its opening day total was five million. Uh, according to box office report, um, five million in its debut debut weekend. You sure about that? Sure about that? Sure about that? Let's double check. Let's double Internet. Check. I'm on CBR. Mm-hmm. That's what they said. Comic book resources. Let's check the numbers. The website, the numbers, which is financial information for films. Okay, worldwide box office is six million dollars right now. Yeah, five million dollar weekend, which is really solid on a budget. Oh of- my God, Collider! Sydney Sweet is immaculate. Scares up historic opening weekend, and then in the story for Neon, <laughs> for Neon, yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be a hit. Headlines, come on, these headlines. Headlines, man, <laughs> made you click on it. Yeah. I know exactly. It's bull- it's, it's lies. Good for neon. It'll make money, and I'm glad they got it a hit on their hands because I love neon. And had neon a makes of, good movies. They do, and they've had a couple of low performers the last couple of years. If you want to see another movie of theirs that they made, check out Perfect Days. Yeah, it's a fantastic film by Neon as well. Neon's a great company. I think that you know, A24 gets so much attention. Neon is a studio that does. A lot of great work as yeah, well with do. independent films. I love seeing their logo in front of movies too. Their yeah. their uh, their production logo is great. But yeah, this movie I I bet it makes about total gross uh, thirty million uh, globally. I think easy, yeah, easy thirty mil. So it's a good it's a good hit, and you know it's going to be successful. And there's a lot of horror movies coming out this this month. There's what a lot of horror movies coming out this month. Yeah, you got the first the first Omen Omen Origins Origins next week Origins the Omen <laughs> the Omen. Very cool. 
All right, well, that wraps our episode on Roadhouse and Immaculate. Let us know what you thought of these films in the comments as well as on the Spotify prompts. Thanks so much for tuning in to Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to become a patron at patreon.com slash Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews if you want to see me get a tattoo. And take care. See you next time. This episode was executive produced by our chosen one patrons, Cody Moen, Andrew Hagen, Benjamin Cook, Calvin Murphy Griggs, Darian, Tyler McFly, Mark Nikaj. Our chosen one patrons are our biggest supporters. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching Raiders of the Lost Podcast. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button as well, notifications for sure. Listen to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, everywhere you can listen to podcasts. And be sure to check out this other content we have on our YouTube channel.